Alright, we're going to continue on. Uh, we're going to talk about the DCG deployments. Ventricular repolarization. So you'll observe the T wave, and what's happening in cardiac cycle is the uh, muscle should be starting to relax. The exact phase is the um, isovolumetric relaxation. is actually the moment between two cardiac cycles, and it's called the TP segment. So, just draw one cardiac cycle, get to the end of the T, and then um, the moment between, before the next one starts, is our TP segment. This would represent most of inflow. Okay, not quite all of it, but most of it. Space between two ECG uh, cycles. So then I kind of just highlighted one there. It's, it's just about most of the inflow. One thing you can do is go straight from one R wave to the other R wave. Um, and that represents your heart rate, your BPM. So I'll just kind of add to this. If you measure straight from here to there, R to R, uh, that, that's your BPM. Let's say that amount of time is the average textbook average of 0.8 seconds, right? Um, so that's that's basically the time between beats. So one heartbeat time between beats is. 0 0.8 seconds times, um, I think I gave this to you before. This is how you calculate beats per minute. You just do the 60 divided by the 0 0.8, and that, and that gives you your heart rate. You should know how to calculate your, your heart rate based on this simple math. 
And so that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to, you're going to measure your R to R. The computer does it for you. So you know, students these days, you, you get to be really lazy with the math because the computer does everything for you. Um, but you know, that's that's how you measure. Now, it's not going to be. It could, it could vary from beat to beat. What you want to do, uh, what you want to do, is try to figure out what it is per minute. Okay, and um, so you can take an average, and I'll show that to you. I think that represents all the ECG components. And um, students always ask me during the lab, you, you don't know if you're doing it right. A good way you can check yourself within your group is check what you measure against this table, um, which is basically in the handout. Where's my handout? Raise your hand if you printed out the lab for today. That, that's it? I made some copies. Let's see how you guys do it. I think I told my other class to print it out, not you guys. I'll be sure I have some copies for you. I didn't mention we're having the ECG lab. I did see some people with exercise masks. Some of you are listening. Some of you are ready to work out. That's good. But anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll enter the lab to make sure we're all <coughs> going to finish. Yeah, that's the key. you got to finish this lab. I ain't doing it any other day. See here. Yeah, there is a page where it has the normal duration. So that you don't have to call me over. Did we do it right? Just see if you're within the normal range, you did it right. Just record the data and do that. <laughs> Another thing students forget to do during the lab is, um, man, how do how you measure that again? You can look at your notes. Um, this is on. You can look at this slide. Okay, it, it tells you how to do it. You can just kind of read the directions. TP segment, end of T to start of next P, and you, you, your group, you guys can uh, figure it out. So it's not a quiz. You can look these things up while you're doing the lab. It, it is a fun lab to do. Uh, it's one of my favorite to see you do. There's, there's three segments that, that um, your subject has to do. You can use one subject for everything, or you can kind of mix and match. It doesn't matter, but just do one subject per thing. Okay? Um, you want to lie down. For one, okay. Lying down has an effect on your physiology, but from going from lying to standing, breathing normally, that has an effect on the physiology. And of course, you're going to exercise for a little while, and that'll have an effect on the physiology. And I think that's pretty obvious. For the one um, from when you're lying down and then you go to the standing position, there's a term you should know called. Um, Orthostatic hypotension. It got kind of blocked by my pictures. Let me write that down. you're supposed to lie for a certain period of time. So when you go horizontal, you're eliminating hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is a column of fluid. Okay, and at, at the bottom of the column is the most pressure because the fluid is on top is pushing down. Okay, you standing up, you're like a column of fluid because you're full of fluids. You know, so when you lie down, you eliminate that. And it's easier for blood to circulate. Okay, I think we know this. When we lie down, we get relaxed, and that's great. Things tend to vasodilate, but when you go from lying and then you immediately stand up, um, the blood kind of rushes down, right, down to your extremities, and your heart feels like the blood pressure is dropping because it is. Um, so for a brief moment in time, you get a drop in blood pressure, and your heart doesn't like that. So what it does is it, it kicks up the heart rate. Okay. So when you lie down and you go from, I think your protocol says to sit up, okay, but really you should stand up, but I think if you sit up, you'll, you'll get the effect. You, you get that little lightheadedness, you know, you know what I'm talking about? 
that's more significant in the elderly. Well, anyways, that, that, that's kind of like the, the blood running down, and you should see an increase in heart rate. Okay, so remember this. I'm telling you what to expect. Okay, sometimes I see students record the data, like, your heart rate increased, and you completely forgot what I said an hour ago. Okay, that's what you expect to see. And if you don't see it, question your procedures. Okay. Um, so that's, that's what I want you to see. It's a baroreceptor reflex. We'll talk more about in detail later. But anyway, here's kind of a graph. Of, uh, this is a good data graph. So what you see here is when you have a drop in blood pressure, the heart tries to compensate by boosting the heart rate. So that's why you have to be lying down for quite a while, I mean, several minutes. I mean, sit up or stand up, you see a jump in heart rate. Okay, so that's one thing you should expect to see in today's lab. Let's see here. Is there anything else? I think that was it. Okay. I want to switch gears here. I, I, I cut and pasted the, the next batch of slides. And uh, I want to get into the cardiac action potential. So now we're shrinking. We're going from ECG, which is the action potentials of the entire heart, the entire cardiac cycle. Now we're going microscopic. Now microscopic anatomy for the heart you have to think about two cell types. The contractile cells, which have a lot of mitochondria, and autorhythmic cells. There's two basic cell types to the heart. Let's call this cardiac. potential in two cell types, contractile cells. This is all you notice in the heart. It's the muscle part of the heart. When you did the dissection, you're not even aware of the autorhythmic cells. We, I didn't even have you look for them because you can't see them with the naked eye, Okay, like the SA node and the AV node. But those are the autorhythmic cells. cells that lie in the SA, the AV nodes. Yeah, and you saw the Purkinje fibers too, but those are the main ones, especially the SA, the sinoatrial node. That gets your heart going. You got it. But the contractile cells are the muscle part. They generate tension. And I mentioned mitochondria because the heart's very aerobic. Um, but the cell types we're talking about, contractile autorhythmic. So for this lecture, it's good to keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is we're going to be making a lot of comparisons between um, muscles of the myocardium versus skeletal muscle. So for contractile cells, think cardiac muscle. But also for today's lecture, compare it to skeletal muscle. Okay, so that's what I'm saying at the bottom of the slide there. And I think the other thing to pay attention to, well, one key difference between cardiac, skeletal, is that cardiac has the presence of these intercalated discs. structure that makes cardiac muscle cardiac muscle. Now, what you see here on the um, histology slide, there's these dense 
dark bars. Those are the intercalated disks. And what they are comprised of is this horizontal part, but then this vertical part. So, so this is a horizontal, and then there's a vertical part. Okay, so that's what I want you to see there. And what I'm trying to show you there, the horizontal part, um, they, they're drawing these like little gap junctions in the horizontal part of the disk. These little gap <coughs> junctions of the horizontal part. That's important for the heart because that depolarization has to spread from cell to cell. And the gap junctions will allow that spread to occur. But then they have this vertical part, it's kind of wavy. But within there, there's all these like little dense plaques. I'll draw a few. these interlocking proteins, it's kind of hard to draw, but they kind of like look like that. And they have all these um, other fibers that provide some strength and support. Anyways, this whole thing I, I drew is called a desmosome. Desmosomes. They're in the vertical part. Go back and look in chapter three if you want to remember what the desmosomes are. They're kind of like um, a glue that holds the muscle cells together. What you have to remember about the heart is how it's different from skeletal muscle is the skeletal muscles have connective tissue that insert onto bone. Okay. We call them tendons. And so when muscle contracts, it's able to move the joint by pulling on the connective tissues that are inserted onto the bone. But cardiac muscle doesn't have that. Its job is to pump. So the cardiac muscle, they're wound in a way, there's just these bundles of fiber that wrap around the ventricles. And so they generate their force by squeezing. So to keep the muscle fibers from ripping apart when they generate that squeezing force, the desmosomes act as a glue to help keep the muscle in um, you know, intact so it doesn't like split apart. Of course, you realize if your heart wall splits, you're going to die, right? Uh, yeah, so you see these are important structurally. They're like a glue. And the gap junctions help for the signal spread. Basically, that's it. So that's why they're important for cardiac muscle. They're not skeletal muscle. So that's that slide. The next slide is just kind of what I just already wrote, like vertical part, horizontal part, with, within a disc. Okay. There's the vertical part at the desmosome. And within the horizontal part, you have some gap junctions. So uh, this is cardiac muscle. That's skeletal muscle. And I wanted to go over some more differences between the two. So let's um, come back to autorhythmic cells. I'm going to release that. Let's just compare uh, cardiac muscle to skeletal muscle. Because they both have striations when you look at it under the microscope. Striations, striations. 
Now, striations means under the microscope, they appear striped in appearance. But what does that really mean? It means they have an organized system of contractile proteins. That's what that means. Okay, when I look at tissue, if I see striations, I say, oh, muscle. If I don't see striations, it's probably some kind of connective tissue. Okay, well, anyway, so as a student, that, that's kind of what you need to appreciate. We see striations under the microscope. All right, so in cardiac muscle, the, the branches of the, the muscle fibers, they branch extensively. It, it even looks like that under the scope. So the benefit of having branches is like if, if you have a cell, and you have branches, and you have branches, and this one branches, and that one branches, and that one branches, and that one branches. I mean, the, the signal, if you have an action potential um, here, I mean, it'll, it'll just spread everywhere where there's a branch point. And that's how the signal spreads throughout the entire organ of the heart, because of the extensive branching. Okay. Branching of cells. And we, and we all know where the signal begins, right? S-A node. Now, it's a little bit different for cardiac muscle, um, a little bit different for skeletal muscle. In skeletal muscle, what I hope you remember is the muscle fibers are more or less in parallel and they're not branched off of each other. Okay. So imagine, you know, let's put this in a box. Let's put this in a box, a little black box. For the muscle cells um, of the heart to contract, they just need the SA node. And the SA node's in the heart. So there's, there's no nerve that has to come into the heart to make it contract. It's all intrinsic. Now, not so for skeletal muscle. We had you memorize the names of the muscles. And we had you memorize the nerves that innervate those muscles. Remember that stress? If your instructor didn't make you do that, they should have. <laughs> That's part of the anatomy. That's, for example, musculocutaneous nerve innervates biceps brachii and that whole thing. That's because for um, skeletal muscle, there's a, we have a central nervous system with brain and spinal cord, you know, and there are somatic nerves that have to like, you know, they have to like enter our black box from the outside. Remember that? And we call that a motor unit. Do you remember that? Remember anything? I'm sure you do. You're just being quiet. All right. The motor unit. One motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that it innervates to get these to fire. Okay. So that's how skeletal muscle works. It's quite different, so you don't need the extensive branching. So we kind of call this like an extrinsic mechanism. Because like some, some nerve from outside the <coughs> organ had to come and innervate it. This one, they, they tend to use the word intrinsic to describe it. Because it just it's kind of all within the black box. There are autonomic nerves that can modify the heart rate, but for the most part, the SA node itself generates ash potential. That I mentioned that the last time. So because of this, uh, my next point we refer to the heart as a functional syncytium. There's that word again. You should see this term syncytium in your book. A syncytium is a fused tissue. Fused tissue, what is that? Well, you, you studied a syncytium on your last exam. Did anyone correctly identify the syncytiotrophoblasts in the lab practical? That was one of them. I'll pass those back to you soon. But anyways, what that was in the repro unit, that syncytium, all the cell membranes, they kind of went away, and all the cytoplasm became this one giant blob of fused tissue. And its job was to digest the endometrium so you can implant it. Right? 
Here, the heart is not a true syncytium, but it acts like one because of how the signal can spread through the heart so easily. It's like it's one big mass of tissue, but it's not. The cells have their integrity, their individual cell membranes, but because of those gap junctions, the signal spreads so easily, it functions like a syncytium. So we want you to know that concept. Now here, not a functional syncytium. We, we call it the, uh, the all or none principle. All or none. All, get all the motor unit or none of it, all right? When this nerve fires, you'll get all of the muscle fibers it innervates to contract, all right? Well, what if that's not enough force for the load you have to move? Well, then you just recruit more motor units, okay? Um, and then you call that the size principle. You can go look that up. If you want more force, recruit more motor units. To increase force, let me write this out. For, for skeletal muscle, to increase force generated, recruit more motor units. So if one's not enough, recruit another one. This will give you more force. Now, skeletal muscle is voluntary muscle. So if you're benching 25 pounds, when you go to 100 pounds, and don't you have to push harder? So you have to go more, right? So that's, that's what we mean by voluntary muscle. It means more grunting in the gym. Uh, but that, not so for the heart. You can't recruit more. The entire heart is already contracting. So when you're exercising and you have to pump harder, each individual cell has to contract harder. So in the heart, all cardiac muscle cells are already contracting. So to increase force, Each individual cell has to contract harder. Each individual cell must contract harder. So we call that, they call that contractility of the heart. This is the cardiac performance. Let's write that word down. Contractility. Now, how do you make your heart stronger? You put your shoes on and you go out and you run. Okay, you do aerobic exercise. That makes your heart stronger. Okay. In the condition of rest, your heart doesn't have to work as hard. So if you're, you know, just a couch potato every day of your life, sedentary lifestyle, it's not good. Okay. You know, you're young, you have the most capacity to exercise, you should. That's kind of what I always encourage uh, young people to do. So anyways, that, 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 that's a key difference between um, cardiac versus skeletal. And in both cases, getting out and running, uh, weight training in the gym, they, they both improve both mechanisms. Okay? When you start lifting the weights, this neural connections they get better, okay? And um, it, get, it gets more efficient. And so when you start lifting heavy weights, and it feels heavy, you know, with training, as, as you well know, it starts to feel lighter. Heavy loads start to feel like medium loads because this is getting more efficient. 
and each muscle fiber, they're increasing in size, you know, you're increasing, every, everything gets better. So training with the weights, and then, you know, the cardiac stuff, then they both have uh, benefits. All right, now what they both have in common, they use massive amounts of calcium. So let's get back down. Calcium is super important. And you should know that too. Go back and look up. Calcium binds the troponin and the tropomyosin, and it exposes the binding site so the myosin head can bind it. Now, at some point, you knew that. So maybe you forgot. Go back and look at it. Calcium is very important. Cross bridge cycling, that's the best problem. Cross bridge cycling. All right, so this picture. Okay, now what I'm going to do is we're going to like ignore skeletal muscle now. I, I want to get back to cardiac uh, muscle and I, I want to start to compare it to the autorhythmic cells of the heart. Okay, so this muscle part of the heart, it's like 99%. Okay, less than 1% of the heart is this conduction system. SA, AV, no, bundle of his, the Purkinje. And you saw the Purkinje fibers, right? Were they like massive, or like all over the place? And you had to look for them. They're so they're teeny tiny. Uh, a very small percentage of the heart. Now, at one point, I was crazy. I would get up at like 4 a.m. and go for a job before I came to this class. I'm not that crazy anymore, but I still get out there. I always tell students the best exercise is the one that you'll do. Okay, that, that's it. If you don't like doing it, you're not going to do it. So try to find something you enjoy. My wife, she needs the social component, so she has to go to a gym, and she has to have a trainer. You pay big bucks for that, and it's well worth it. You either pay now, or you pay later. Right, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Better to pay now, so you don't have to pay later. Okay, let's auto with cells. Okay, so the autorhythmic cells, we want to talk about the action potentials between these two cells. They're quite different. And it tells you about the physiology of the heart. If you look at, I, I got these traces from the Marriott book. Basically, the trace for the autorhythmic cell, you're looking at a, a waveform like that. And for the um, contractile cell, it's looking like this, basically. Okay. So the action potential, I mean, it's literally the spiky looking thing. This is the action potential. That's the AP. And this one, if it's quite a bit longer, that's the AP. So they're different. And we'll go through the differences. Um, well, the big picture is uh, the contractile cells, this is the action potential of the myocardium, the muscle part. This is basically SA and AV nodes. The, the, the goal. Um, is that these are a pacemaker potential because you self-generate action potentials. The pacemaker potential is this part right there. This part right there. This, um, you guys remember that thing called um, the threshold potential? Yeah. The threshold is like the millivoltage that you attain within the cell, and it fires an action potential. And if you just reach the threshold, you'll fire. Okay. So the pacemaker potential is this 
slow depolarization to threshold, slow rise to threshold, a slow automatic rise to threshold. It just happens. It's like you get to like this negative potential, and it doesn't stay there. There's no rest. There, there's no resting potential. As soon as you get there, you slowly depolarize, and it just keeps happening. And whatever rate you get the threshold, that establishes your heart rate. Okay. That, that's, your, that's your heart rate. They call them pacemaker potential because that's your heart rate. So think of your SA node. The cells in there are, are, are doing this. And whatever that rate is, um, that's your heart rate. Now, it's different for this. The action potentials, um, well, there is a resting potential here. So this is our resting potential. But, the, but there's no there's no there's no threshold. There's no graded potential. Remember graded potential? These like little teeny weeny the polarizations that get you to the threshold. There's none of that. So there, there's no there's no graded potentials. There's no threshold potential. No, no threshold potential. You go straight from rest to action potential. Okay, that, that's a key difference. And and why? You just got the gap junction, the just the depolarization just gets right into you. That's it. Okay, the gap junction makes it happen. So when you contract, you're going to generate tension. These cells have no striation. They're not going to generate any kind of tension. They just spread the signal. Once they spread the signal, they're spreading the action potential to all the cells, okay? especially to these cells. So these cells generate tension. So let me use another line to start to generate tension. And that tension is our force of pumping. Technically, tension is a pulling force, but because you're wrapped around the ventricle, it creates the pumping for the ejection of the blood from the heart. OK. Well, in this slide, it's a review of what we lectured on the last time. It's like. Uh, you start at the SA node, throughout all the atria, you get to the AV node, and we witness a delay, which we can see in the PR interval. <clears throat> you go down the septum, you get to the apex, and you spread up the side through those Purkinje fibers. And some of you who are even able to see those little white thread Purkinje fibers go straight to the nipple-shaped muscle called the papillary muscle. Well, anyways, the time that it takes to go from SA all the way down to the ventricular muscle, it's about 150 milliseconds. Okay, so it's not very long. All right, so for uh, my neurophys review, I always want to make sure students um, remember the, the basic idea so we can talk about action potentials again. Just depolarization and repolarization.
neurophysiologists love to use this word called permeability. I mean, that just means what ions can permeate and get into the cell because they have, like, you know, channels for it. And for the most part, we talk about sodium and potassium as carrying the current that the cells are permeable to. And they help create this, this membrane potential. Um, So if you have a cell membrane, the membrane permeability, uh, the membrane potential, that term is always used, it's just the potential difference in charge across the cell membrane. Okay. Um, let's say, for example, you have a positive charge, and it, uh, across, it, it, it attracts a negative charge. They're kind of like attracted to each other across the cell membrane. So maybe it goes like this. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page here. I mean, if you were to take a voltmeter and measure the difference, the potential difference, there isn't any. So you'd measure zero, right? Well, that's not polarized at all. But usually what we see in a lot of cells, like for example, when we teach you resting membrane potential, you know, the sodium, potassium, ATP, ACE pump, uh, we, we go through that whole song and dance, and, uh, and remember this stuff, I think. And the negative inside the cell, or this is inside the cell, the inside of the cell is negative with respect to the outside, right? And when you measure that potential difference, usually in some cells we measure a, a negative 70. Okay, so that's polarized, right? You have more positive on the outside than the inside, and so this condition is polarized. Now, usually inside the cell, you have a high concentration of potassium ions. The students always say, well, doesn't that positively, positivity mess with this? It doesn't. This is just the membrane potential. Anywhere else in the cell, it's supposed to be like not affecting the membrane potential. Okay, that's our understanding. So, but you have a lot of potassium in the cell. So, um, but you also have exterior to cell, interstitial fluids, you have a lot of sodium outside the cell. So the main thing in action potential is the sodium current. When you allow sodium to rush into the cell, that's one of the most powerful currents you see in neurophys. So imagine you had a channel for sodium that allowed sodium into the cell. Because sodium carries a full positive charge, it can't get past the hydrophobic zone of the cell membrane. So imagine this is open and get this huge influx of positive charge due to sodium. And what, what I say in my lecture, and other people do too, we say you depolarized. This is the memory potential, right? It's not polarized anymore. It's depolarized. It's not polarized. It's so fast and it's so powerful. I mean, usually you see this like huge like upstroke in the membrane potential. Then the cell repolarizes, and usually it's, it's potassium that leaves the cell. Call it potassium efflux. So that efflux of potassium out of the cell, which happens secondarily in time, um, that will repolarize you. So those are those terms. What you just got to keep in mind is when the cell is depolarized, 
the permeability, which I usually abbreviate with a capital P, the cell is more permeable to sodium much more than it is potassium. That's usually the proper way to think of it. At the time you depolarize, you're more permeable to this than to that. But in repolarization, it reverses because you know there's that sodium inactivation channel, inactivation gate, I should say. It's like a little ball and chain that like plugs it up. Anyways, so when you repolarize, the, the sodium channels become inactivated, and during that time, the permeability of the cell to potassium is much greater than that of sodium. Okay, so that's the end of my review. Um, so kind of like bring that to like this, we have to like look at all these like different ash potential traces. And I think this, the two we're gonna do, uh, uh, so the format of my slides, hold on, let, let me push this real quick. Hold on. So of all of these traces, just pay attention to the top one and the bottom one. That's what we're focusing on today. The SA node is going to represent our study of the autonomic cells. And the ventricular muscle is going to represent the contractile cells. Notice Purkinje fibers, they look really close to ventricular muscle because Purkinje fibers are, are modified muscle fibers that have that pacemaker potential. And we're just going to stick this one down there and that one up there. And um, what we're going to talk about is how these different currents cause different parts of the ash potential. Okay. And I think I want to um, do that on Friday. For now, make sure we have enough time to finish the lab. Uh, I want to demo it. And then we'll take a break and come back and we'll go right into lab. Some extra copies of the lab. Um, it's not enough for everyone, but um, so if you don't mind sharing, I'll leave them over here. And if you wanted to print your own out, you could do it during the break, I suppose, if you've got a spot on campus that allows you to print things out. But that should at least get you through. So, um, since you're working in groups, you'll have to form eight groups. I know we had 10 groups yesterday, but we only have eight biopack machines. So eight groups means about four to five per. Okay, if that's a problem for you guys, I usually let you self-group, but if you have a problem finding a group, I can help you. I can locate you within a group. Um, so if I ask you to put someone to your group, you have to say yes. Okay, I'm sorry. But no, we're closed. You can't, you can't say that to me. Okay. Yeah. Let's see here. Ah, so what I had said prior to the cardiac ash potential is uh, three segments. Segment one, lying down. So if you didn't bring a yoga mat, figure, figure some way to lie down semi-comfortably. 
in this room. So we do. After subject sits up. I'll just say sits up. With normal breathing. I don't know why they say that. I think you remember to breathe when you sit up. Um, Okay, this one is after exercise with deep breathing. And the deep breathing is a good cue because, you know, nice, relaxed breath, that, that's the best way to recover. And I think it'll give you the, the, the best result. After exercise with deep breathing. Okay, so those, those are the three things that your subject will have to do. You know, it doesn't take long to get your data. Um, let's see here. Oh, and by the way, for this lab, I've only given you a part of it, and it starts on page 462. It starts on. So if you print it out at home, it starts from, um, before 462, but we're only doing it from page 462 all the way to the end. And the end, the last pages are review pages, so it goes to 468. And I only expect one report per group. And this is not going to be due until Friday. Because there are some review questions at the end, and I want to make sure that you have plenty of time to answer those as a group. And um, but today, what you got to do is you got to get your data. You have to get the data today. You can't you can't do that outside of the lab. Uh, but you know, if you want to like take your time and make sure your answers look good, your data looks good. And if anyone wants to turn in a solo report, you're free to do that too. You don't have to go in with your group. Although you should have the same data. Some students, you know, they get more out of it if you just do it yourself. I, I totally get that. Uh, so you can decide if you want to go in with a group or go solo. Just be sure nothing is left blank. I mean, I only expect you to turn in 462, 468. The easiest way for you, you to lose points, just leave something blank. It makes it really easy for me to mark wrong. No answer. Okay. Be sure everything's answered and you'll be okay. Um, all right, so let me um, just kind of show you instead of just looking at this thing. What I did was I created little goodie bags for you, just to make it easy. Okay, everything you need is going to be in here. Let me uh, open up the software here. You should be looking for this icon here, VSL Lessons. There's Pro and there's Lessons. Don't do the Pro. Pro is a custom protocol. We, we have our own preset protocol, so we can just go to Lessons. Oh, I got to turn the thing on. That's mistake number one that I see students do. I just did it. So um, if this is hooked up, I'll tell you what, let's take a break, then I'll demo it. This isn't hooked up right. I'm gonna use the next video. Come back at come back at 8.45.